Okay. Hi, folks. So we're here today with uh, Rob Avis from Verge Permaculture and Adaptive Habitat out of Calgary, Alberta. Uh, Rob has been my friend and mentor for the past you know, three, three and a half years now. Uh, he is a mechanical engineer, uh, permaculture educator, consultant. And the reason I'm interviewing him today is because I would, what, uh, he is what I would call uh, an amateur holistic nutritionist. Um, he's been, he, we talk a lot, ton about diet whenever we're, you know, traveling around doing our, our consulting work. And uh, he has probably one of the most unique perspectives and varied perspectives on diet that I've ever come across. Um, so I just wanted to, to get him on record for uh, what he thinks about uh, diet when, as it relates to optimal human health. So Rob, uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. Why don't you tell us a bit about your story and what got you interested in, in human health? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Dakota. Um, well, I think we have to go back right to the, the beginning um, before we can kind of get into what uh, it's, it's interesting to look at people and, and when they make their decisions in their lives to change their diets. Um, there's always some sort of an aha moment and sometimes they're more um, critical than others or, or uh, what's the word? Um, hmm, I can't think of the word right now, but like, um, uh, some some of these events cause more stress than others essentially and so the the transformations can can be a lot more extreme so for example i have a student who came through my program and i think she was like four or five hundred pounds um when she just when she finally had the aha moment it's like oh my gosh i gotta do something about this um for me there are kind of two main things um when i was young my dad had cancer um and i didn't really know what was going on with him but um you know he went through all the chemotherapy and um, has had yearly checkups after that. And, um, that really struck me later in life. And it was really interesting to see how it's like, you get cancer and the solution to it is you just go and get medicated, um, as opposed to actually transforming your life. And so one of the things my dad did teach me in life is that there's always this kind of root cause analysis that you can do. And, um, when you think about chemotherapy, um, and, and other kind of uh, pharmaceutical approaches to dealing with disease they're they're all very much driven by dealing with symptoms and not dealing with root causes um, so that was a you know a pivotal pivotal thing for me when I was young but I grew up in a cake factory so um, and in fact before the cake factory had a pie factory so I've always kind of been around confection and and dessert um, and uh, and so I grew up eating a pretty good diet at home, but there was always sweets around. Yeah. And so by the time I was in university, um, I had met Michelle, my wife. Um, and then slowly I started transferring my life down to, to Calgary because she had moved to Calgary after uh, she had finished university. We were both engineers and we went to the same school. Um, the other aha moment that I had was when my wife started carrying angry candies around um, <laughs> with her because I would get hangry. And I was like, wait a second here. If she's got to carry candies around to deal with my uh, hangry outbreaks, um, basically I would get really ornery um, and unable to operate um, when I got hungry. So if I wasn't getting a consistent uh, meal on a regular basis, she didn't want to be around me. Um, and so the solution to not being around me, is, as opposed to walking away, was to carry candies in her purse because I didn't carry a purse. And also, typically, when you're hangry, you don't think about those things. <clears throat> so it's just like, I need to hurt somebody or get food, um, and preferably, I'll get food. <clears throat> so um, that really got me thinking, and I started doing more research into it, and that led me to the conclusion that I was hypoglycemic. So I was well on my way to becoming diabetic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I've got I've to deal with this, because just having my wife carrying candies around is not, not the solution. Hmm. Wow. <clears throat> that's crazy it's really neat being hypo hypoglycemic too because once you've been there you start seeing it in other people yeah and uh it's it's very interesting body language and, and you realize that most of a lot of north america suffers from this this hangry condition and uh you can see why diabetic or diabetes is going to become uh it already is epidemic but it's it's well on its way to becoming even even worse yeah 
So can, can you give us like a snapshot before and after of, of your diet and, and how, and then how that correlates to like a snapshot of before and after of your health. You've kind of given us, given us the before of your, your health. What's your health like now in relation to what your diet? So, I mean, in terms of my physique, you'd never really, I mean, other than the fact that I've probably put on, you know, 15 or 20 pounds in muscle in the last three years, um, I'm, I'm a little bit beefier now. So I probably look bigger than I did when I had hypoglycemia, but um, I was also a lot younger back then. So my body, my body's metabolism was quite a bit higher. But <clears throat> if we look at some other metrics, um, uh, from going to from, from co coming from a place where I had to have three meals a day, I was probably eating a loaf of bread every day or day and a half. Um, not really uh, worried about what I consumed. It was, it was, you know, pretty, pretty standard fare, I would say. To now I eat once every day and sometimes once every two days. Uh, actually, sometimes I'll go as long as five or six days without eating. Uh, no issues. Um, so one of the reasons that I've been interested in that is just to see like, what does the body actually need? I mean, what are, are, are there's all these myths around eating three times a day, eating six times a day. Um, and just kind of pushing that limit because one of the things that, um, that you know, cause you listen to me all the time, but I am, uh, so curious about everything and, but specifically about human physiology and hum the chemistry in the body and. And because I, I can only really experiment on my own body, I don't feel right doing that to my kids or um, you know, asking my wife to do it. Um, I'm always running these little experiments and seeing what the results are and seeing how it, it changes things. Um, probably one of the most interesting things outside of me being able to live an incredibly energetic life without eating for long periods of time. Um, and I'm, and I'm not, when I say that, I'm not talking about being you know, anorexic or bulimic or any of that stuff. Um, it's just fasting. It's, it's, it's like, and when I come off of a fast, I eat as much as I want. Um, I try and keep it within a certain subset of macronutrients, but it's just fasting and, and it's just an experiment. Um, but probably one of the most interesting things that occurred outside of me reversing the hypoglycemia was um, the fact that I don't wear, wear glasses anymore. Yeah. So, um, I was well on my way towards, um, um, needing stronger and stronger glasses every single year. Um, so that was interesting. So I'm glasses free now. Um, and the other interesting thing that has occurred as a result of this is, uh, you know, my overall uh, dental health has, has improved. And so, um, I, uh, you, we were talking yesterday about, you don't know anybody that doesn't have any cavities. Um, I have two cavities in my mouth. Um, they're really tiny. Um, and so I've never really had a lot of cavities, but uh, something in my body, and I haven't figured it out yet, has shifted um, such that I can't actually eat sugar anymore. I can't eat honey. I can't eat sugar. I can't even eat maple syrup. Um, if I go beyond a certain amount of, um, of sugar, um, I get an incredible amount of inflammation in my mouth. And so there's still something going on there. And it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of beneficial in a way because it just it keeps me off of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I, I've never actually felt better. I still think I've got further to go. I've got more improvements to make. Um, but I think I'm really narrowing in on um, what works for my body. And what's really neat is in, in my family, when I start experimenting with myself, um, usually there's, it's met with a lot of resistance within my household. Um, I live with my mother-in-law and I, I live with obviously my wife and my two kids. Um, but there's about a two or three month lag period there. And so after that lag period, people start to um, follow. Part of it is because they see improvement, but the other part of it is that I do almost all the cooking. So, um, <laughs> When I only cook once a day, um, other people might be too lazy to go and, and cook as well. And so it just inevitably follows that path. And so my mother-in-law has lost close to 40 pounds. You know, she's wow. getting close to her 70s now. Um, her, her black hairs are starting to come back. Like it's, it's cool to watch the transformation in other people as well, because then you just don't think you're a freak. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. <clears throat> so, I mean, 
as an engine, like you obviously have the mind of an engineer and you're very, from knowing you for the last three years, you're very process oriented. What is your kind of, you know, step three or step or five step process for trying to like optimize your own diet? What's the, what's the flow chart that looks like for when Rob, you know, reads something and then, you know, what's the, what's that phase look like? Well, I didn't really have one until there was one other kind of big crisis that I went through um, several times uh, after I became hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was about 17 years old that, uh, so I was actually in the midst of being hypoglycemic, but it happened several times. So I think it was like 17, 23, and 26 or 27. Um, I had... Um, I'll get into the process after this. Um, I, I had um, multiple, I'm, I'm just gonna put a disclaimer here, we're gonna talk about some adult stuff. So if you, <laughs> if you don't like the talk of uh, bodily function and stuff, you might not like the next section here. Um, so I ended up getting um, blood in my stool and so I've had, I had multiple tests. Um, I had, um, very very I had a colonoscopy multiple times and each time obviously they were looking for cancer and, and given my father's history with cancer um, it was really concerning it was not a pleasant experience and it just kept happening over and over again well, well let's do another inspection let's do another inspection <clears throat> each time it came out negative thank goodness and um, but then at the end it was like well we don't really know what's going on <clears throat> And that really pissed me off. It's like, um, so, you know, one of my insights was that, and, and this is an insight I think a lot of people have had, is that the medical system is incredible. <clears throat> I'm super grateful to it. It's really good at dealing with acute issues. It's horrible at understanding chronic issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that exists within all of our society. We, we, we struggle to look to the long term and we struggle to look for root causes. We're really good at, at fighting fires, though. <clears throat> so, um, and we can we can use that analogy in the way we build houses, how we manage our economy. Um, yeah, it's just <clears throat> it must be something in human nature. I'm not sure. And so, getting that answer, well, we don't know. Um, started me kind of running my own journey, and it took me a couple of these experiences to really kind of get into the to the scheme of things. And so I said, well, um, I think I had read a book talking about how many medical papers were written um, in a day. And, and, and like right now, just to kind of, I don't know what it was back then because I can't remember, but right now it's something like a new medical paper gets put out every 45 seconds globally. And so with all that research going on, there's no way that a doctor can keep up with that. It's yeah. impossible. And so he's operating on the knowledge he got at school and whenever he gets time to fit in a paper that might be interesting or conferences they go to, sometimes they're getting information from pharmaceutical companies. So um, it's impossible to, to keep up with it. And so um, I started doing my own research onto why this was happening and it led me down a whole rabbit hole. So generally when we end up with, when I end up with a problem that I can't deal with or one of my family members does, I go back to the medical literature most of it's published online. Um, and when, when I bring these uh, papers up to my doctor, they've never heard of them. So, which, mm -hmm. which could, because it's, again, it's so overwhelming. We live in that abundance economy where there's more information than we can put to productive use. And so the onus is now, um, in my opinion, being put back onto the person who's dealing with the issue, um, which isn't going to work for everybody. Not everybody has a scientific mind or can read and get through the minutia of these, these medical papers. Um, but, uh, and I don't really enjoy reading some of them either, but I, I enjoy the symptoms that I'm dealing with less than, than I enjoy the reading. So I push myself through the reading. Um, so usually medical papers is a great resource. Um, I read a lot of books on health. So I've got a, a whole library, uh, on different, um, you know, different books on health. And that's really helped me to inform, you know, basal processes within the human body. So one book, for example, that I recommend everybody read is a book by Gary Taubes 
um, why we get fat and what uh, why we get fat and what you can do about it. Um, he wrote another book that's a summary of his bigger book, Good Calories, Bad Cal Calories, um, and that was a pivotal pivotal book that I read that kind of changed my course um, with regards to how I eat. And when I started learning about fats and cholesterol, um, specifically saturated fats and cholesterol, proteins and carbohydrates, and how it interacted with the human body, I started to see connections with some of the symptoms that I was dealing with. It made sense why I was hypoglycemic. Um, I saw connections back to my father's cancer. Um, and so that was really one of the first books that um, got me thinking about um, some of the conventional dietary information versus how we potentially should be should be eating. Um, but what's really interesting with all these diet books is that they always give you one side of the fence. Yeah. And actually, the fence is not two sided. It's more like octagonal. So there's like multiple facets around the fence, and you have to kind of look at all of them simultaneously to kind of get a real uh, perspective. And, and uh, one other facet that I think very few people look at, um, although um, Sally Fallon, who, who you and I have been talking about the last couple of days, I would say she, she understands this, um, is the anthropological facet. Mm -hmm. So just taking the information from Gary Tobbs or um, the guy who wrote The Plant Paradox or any of these other diet to wheat belly um, misses a really important part, um, which is the anthropological piece um, that I think is super important to understand, um, given kind of the amount of time it takes for the human genome to shift. So the average, um, they say that for a genetic mu mutation to occur in a human population, it takes 75,000 years. So if you're not looking at what humans were doing 12, 13, 15,000 years ago, and, and the kind of dietary approaches they were taking, then you're missing the point. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, I'm just trying to kind of pull a, a step one, step two of that. And, uh, the, right. <laughs> I, no, no, but so I've got like really starting off is like, you, you have to have a basic understanding of just like, like yeah. bodily functions is, is step one. And, and also a, a basic understanding of, of anthropological patterns. Um, so it's like, like patterns in the body and patterns in our own kind of genome and our own history. And then from there, uh, I really like your, your idea of, of basically going back to the science, looking for more patterns as they relate to symptoms that you're dealing with. Um, and, um, but, but you're, because you have that, that kind of background foundation of how the, how the body actually functions and, and how it's functioned for tens of thousands of years, um, you can fit those symptoms into those things and, and try to look for, you know, different weak links that might be popping up as a result to how you're living versus, you know, how people used to live. Uh, totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, un I think everybody needs to understand, like, this is your only body. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it behooves you to ignore how it functions. I think you should, in the same way, you should know how to change the oil in your car or at least know that you need to get the oil changed um, and you should understand you know when your brakes in your vehicle stop functioning like you should have a basic understanding of this body um, and and so understanding anthropological your anthropological past and understanding basic kind of food body chemistry um, you don't need to become a doctor but there's a lot that you can do to kind of improve your overall knowledge of your own bodily system um, and once you start to, you read a few of these books and we can put them in the show notes below, mm. um, you start to be able to deduce your own, um, uh, come up with your own conclusions about things. Um, and, and then once you've got that knowledge, you can go back to the science, look at, um, what other researchers are looking for. Um, and then. And then I think what I do typically is I will go and look for um, things that I can adapt within my diet or within my, um, because it's not just diet, it's also like the overall health um, has to do with um, 
the disturbance that we place onto our body as well. So part of that disturbance is through our gut. But um, for example, I was, I was watching a doctor the other day who said, well, skin cancer actually is more to, has more to do with sunglasses than it does um, with sun. Mm -hmm. So the pineal gland in our head interprets how much UV radiation we're getting and then makes decisions about how much skin pigment to put onto our face or onto our skin. And so, um, you know, how much weight we're lifting, are we living a sedentary lifestyle, all of these things. You and I have talked a lot about signaling. And, and so um, our body, one of the signals that we get is through our gut, but we also get signals through our eyes. I'm sure our nose has signals that, I mean, I think our pheromones come through our nose, um, our ears. So if you go to sleep every night and you're living like I do in Calgary and you've got a standing sine wave, um, that increases cortisol, which changes how your arteries function and everything else in your body. Um, and if you're not sleeping properly, your body can't heal. So everything in our body, every kind of sensory organ that we have creates signals and our bodies make decisions on what to do with those signals. I think the, so, so once you've kind of collected all this information, you've got a basic understanding, you've looked at the literature, now it's time to run experiments. Mm -hmm. And I, I come up with hypotheses about why one thing is happening versus another. And then I, I start running them and I make sure that I'm not, you know, being dangerous or anything like that. Um, and I can talk about a few of those experiments, but I think it's really important steps or these ideas or these experiments on themselves that when you're reading these diet books that you are able to assess out the dogma. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, you know, I, I live mostly, I would say I live a modified ketogenic diet uh, most of the time which means that, you know, if I'm following it dogmatically, I'm consuming, I, I weigh 205 pounds. So I'm consuming about 200 grams of fat a day, about 100 grams of protein, and um, about 20 grams of carbohydrates, which come in the form of salad. So that would be about 10 to 12 cups of salad a day. And it's a great diet. Um, but if you read the ketogenic books, what they'll tell you is that a human should live in a ketogenic state 12 months of the year for the rest of their life, which I think is BS. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the, the diet books will talk about how body fat is bad. And I actually don't think body fat is bad at all. I think it's just another organ. Um, I think it's incredible. Uh, I was just talking to my brother-in-law. They did, they did an experiment if you were a good swimmer, you could swim from the coast of England to the coast of France with something like four pounds of body fat. Like how many boats could cross the channel on four pounds of body fat? Like fat is an amazing resource, mm -hmm. but um, if you're always in storage mode, you become obese. And if you're always in a ketogenic mode, then you're, you're not going to have any surplus essentially to draw down in times where there's not enough food. Absolutely. So that's where the anthropological piece comes in. And, mm -hmm. and so I would say, go and read all these diet books. But another one is the plant paradox. If you, if you listen to that guy, he tells you to have what he calls it a veganic ketogenic diet. Well, we can't run 7 billion people on a veganic ketogenic diet. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so you really have to watch for kind of that dogma and that's where the anthrop anthropological piece comes in to help kind of round out that, that knowledge. Interesting. Oh, that's great. So it's, yeah, it's like, like step one is a, a basic understanding of, of our own bodies and, and the, and the bodies of our ancestors. Um, uh, and then like looking at basically looking back at that baseline and comparing that baseline to, to what your symptoms are. Uh, and again, you're looking for patterns there. And um, once you, uh, yeah, that you, you, then you look for those, looking for those patterns within your own self, try to find uh, weak links as they relate to those patterns. And then it's like it just experimenting and but experimenting holistically where you're you're always asking the questions like what if i'm what if i'm wrong and trying to look at both sides of the coin as opposed to like you said being dogmatic about it i really like that and it's i mean it's interesting that that's that's uh, <laughs> it's like basically a mirror image of of our consulting process of, of how we go to look at land and and how to, how to see how healthy land is and and um and trying to figure out like what what 
uh, someone should be doing on land, um, it always starts off as like, what does the land want to be? Right. And <clears throat> yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. Once you get to that, that last iteration of, of experimentation and you see good results, um, I'm, I have no qualms using um, food inputs that are not of my bioregion when I'm going through my experimentation phase. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm just trying to find, I'm, I'm trying so many different pathways to get to where I want to be. And once I've found a pattern that works, that's when I take the last step, which is, okay, I found something that works for this. Now, how does this relate to my bioregion? How would these mi micro or macronutrients have been derived from my locale? So, um, as an example, um, you know, I, I like to put coconut oil or medium chain triglyceride oil into my coffee in the morning. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. We don't need to get into that right now. But um, uh, pork fat is one of the, it's basically, I mean, pigs are basically running coconuts. Um, it's like if you had to put a coconut tree and um, a coconut palm and an olive tree together, you'd end up with a pig. <laughs> um, and a whole bunch of attitude. <clears throat> and so um, the you know, end expression of that kind of a fat it, uh, is going to end up coming from, um, as you move further north, essentially, and, and you get less and less olives and less and less coconuts, <laughs> um, we end up moving our saturated fats um, more into the animal kingdom. Um, so it's okay to start running experiments with things that you have freely available for you at the grocery store. But eventually what you're going to want to do is find your bioregional source of it. And um, in a lot of cases, I think that that you're going to see another step change in, in health improvement as a result of it. So, you know, we buy your pork um, from your farm and pork is one of the highest sources of vitamin D, which we're all deficient in. Um, and I think the reason is, is that we live in offices and we eat animals that are grown in barns. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things kind of cascade into themselves and they create all these complex downstream effects, which can take years to manifest. And because of the long cycle time between, you know, you know, uh, a problem, an emergent problem, um, it can be very confusing with regards to what the cause and effect is. Absolutely. Uh, you, you mentioned bioregionally, uh, bioregional diets, and, and this is a conversation that you and I have had a, had a lot around what, what is a bioregionally appropriate diet. Um, yeah, could you, can you chat a bit about that and, and also tie in like what, what your diet looks like throughout the year based on our bioregion here in, in central Alberta? Totally. Yeah, so I think that, and, and this is coming back to those diet books, I mean, a guy in California writing the South Beach diet or the plant paradox or whatever these diet books are, every single one of these books has a data point and there's something valuable potentially in them. And so you have to read each of these books saying, okay, there's probably only one or two or three good tidbits in each of these books. What are they? Um, and, and in order to figure out what they are, you have to have an understanding of your own physiology and you have to have an understanding of anthropology. Um, and so I think it's really the anthropology that helps to understand this bioregional diet component uh, yeah. better than anything else. Probably one of the best books I read on that was called Pandora's Seed. And I think the subtitle is something like the, um, the Hidden Consequence of Agriculture or something like that. Uh, anyways, we can put the link in the show notes below. And... Um, one of the things that struck me about that book was that before agriculture, and this is going to depend on the anthropologist that you read, um, because some anthropologists are not going to necessarily agree with this timeline, but basically around uh, 12, 13,000 years ago, um, we came out of, or we went into, sorry, the Younger Dryas, which was the last freezing, if you will. And the human population got to a really small number. Um, and 
that was essentially, again, it depends on the anthropologist. Some people say that we've been doing agriculture for many more thousands of years, but we'll just use this timeline for now because at some point this story probably was true. Um, it might have just happened at a slightly different time frame, but um, essentially what happened was, uh, the story, as the story goes, we were forced into agriculture. We were forced to start planting uh, or taking responsibility for our own cultivation of plants. And uh, but prior to that, we were beholden to the micro and macro nutrients that our ecosystem provided to us at the time that they provided it in the quantities that were, were provided to us. And so if you think about, um, and we'll talk about the Northern Hemisphere right now, um, specifically the ecosystem that you and I live in, but we have um, carbohydrates available to us in very short windows of time. So kind of like July to let's say October or, no or November, depending on how warm your climate is. Um, and so if you were a hunter gatherer back then, you would be consuming, and sometimes it's better to think of this in terms of a bear. Okay, so a bear would have a similar physiology to us. Um, and they don't store food necessarily in the way that humans store food. They store it in fat as opposed to in root cellars. Um, so if you think about our ecosystem, um, and, and you think about this in terms of bears, and we'll come back to humans in a second, they ha have access to carbohydrates in a very short window. And what's really interesting about carbohydrates and how they interact with the chemistry of our body is that carbohydrates spike insulin. Well, insulin is a hormone that sends a signal to your body to store fat. So what will happen is insulin will first store um, uh, calories in the liver in the form of glycogen, uh, sorry, in, uh, glycogen in, in our muscles and will form, form uh, store calories in our liver. And then once your liver and your muscles are full through the consumption of carbohydrates, then it'll start to store it, store it as fat in our body. And so insulin is primarily a fat storage signal. And so if you've ever had a bowl of pasta, you know that you can't ever just eat one bowl. You have to go back for more. You, pasta is one of those foods that you will eat until you hate yourself. And a lot of carbohydrates are like that. And if you've ever wondered why that is, is that you're making decisions about what to eat based on the insulin response in your body. Your body really wants to store fat because it knows that it's a survival mechanism. So. If you think about living within your ecosystem, as soon as those Saskatoons are ripe or the raspberries are ripe or the apples are ripe, um, you eat them, they taste sweet, you like them, your body uh, captures the fact that you're, um, you're in carbohydrate, the carbohydrate season, you wanna eat more. Um, the sugar and carbohydrates are addictive and they're addictive specifically because it's a survival mechanism within your body. So once we got into that younger dryas and we were starting to for we were forced into growing our own foods, most of the foods that we started growing were carbohydrate based because they stored for really long periods of time. So a, a hunter gatherer would have gorged on carbohydrates when they were available, just like a bear does when he's you know going through the summertime to try and store fat so they can survive all winter. Well, hunter gatherers would have done the same thing. They would have gorged on carbohydrates, put a few pounds of fat on to help get through the winter time. Um, and as soon as the carbohydrates were done, their diets would have shifted over to proteins and fats, um, which would have got them through the winter time um, and potentially even long fasting periods of time before the carbohydrates are ready for the next season. So fat can be thought of more, of more as a seasonal organ that ebbs and flows based on the season. And it helps us get through those hunger gaps, which in our ecosystem exists sometime between you know, December and, and May or June. Um, and so a combination of fasting and um, saturated fats and proteins would have kind of got us through that period of time. Now, fast forward to the agricultural revolution where we're growing all these carbohydrates. Our bodies are being sent signals every day that we're entering into the longest winter of all time. Like we're all preparing for, you know, three or four year ice ages um, with the amount of fat that we're all storing on our body because we're consuming so many carbohydrates. It's not that carbohydrates are bad, which is what all the ketogenic books will tell you. It's that we're eating it out of scale and we're eating it out of time. So if you eat carbohydrates in the right scale and time, they can pop. I, I, I think it's ridiculous to think that carbohydrates are bad. Mm -hmm. All the macronutrients are there for a reason, but I think 
you know, the process that you and I've developed, which is like placement, form, scale, and time, if we look at diet through those four lenses, we can actually go to anywhere on the planet and say, well, what's the bioregional diet for this location? So for me, when, because I live on modified ketogenic diet, when the fruit's coming out, like right now, I eat as much, I give myself permission to eat as much fruit as I want. I'm a fruit bat right now. Like I'm a fruititarian actually. Um, I just got a text this morning. My peaches are coming in from BC. So I'm going to eat like case lots of peaches because that's, that's my quality of life statement. And that's how <laughs> I put fat on my body before winter. Saskatoons, raspberries, apples. Um, I eat as much fruit as I can seasonally, but I eat almost no fruit um, through the winter time. Um, so my diet, when people ask me what my diet is and what a bioregional diet is for Alberta, um, I'm fruititarian for part of the year. I'm vegan. Well, I'll go, I'll start from right now. So right now I'm fruititarian that transfers over to, um, so I'm very high on the carbohydrate scale right now. As we go into fall, I'm going to transfer over to more proteins and fats, mostly on the fat side. So that's why your, your pork is so great. It's got so much fat on the outside. So uh, one pork chop pretty much meets my daily requirement of fat. Um, and that's a, that's a compliment. <laughs> um, and that will exist like that until probably kind of March, April, May, somewhere in there. I might put some microgreens in there um, occasionally, which um, is great because our, our prairie produces a lot of seed. And then as we go into spring, I'm pretty much vegan. I eat tons and tons of greens with some, some other ancillary fats as well, sometimes some olive oil, um, a little bit of meat. Um, and then we run through the cycle again. So I, I kind of exist within all of the dietary spectrums based on what my ecosystem is producing at that time. Totally. Oh, that's brilliant. <clears throat> and so, I mean, we've um, we haven't really touched on, on permaculture yet. And so, uh, I mean, that's, that's obviously what, what you and Michelle do for a living is, is, is help to empower and, and inspire other people to, to uh, live more in tune with their environment. Um, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. So th let, let's, let's segue now into like, wh what is, what is permaculture? The all, the all, I know. So we'll need about three more hours now to. <laughs> I mean, just really quickly, uh, if we look at the human paradigm right now, Western culture, it's how do we meet human needs, period. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. At any expense. Mm -hmm. Like everything else, we meet human needs and everything else is an externality. Permaculture is how do we meet human needs while enhancing the ecosystem's health. Mm -hmm. And initially it sounds like a very environmentalist um, approach to living. And it's actually not. Um, it's very selfish. Just like how do we meet human needs is very selfish. This is also very selfish as well. But... I would say it's selfishness with intelligence um, because we know that meeting human needs while enhancing the ecosystem's health is actually only going to improve our own health and our own longevity and the longevity of our children and their children. Um, and I would argue that um, GMOs and um, conventionally grown foods that are covered in pesticides and herbicides, while they're hurting the ecosystem, they're also hurting us. We're not actually doing a good job of meeting our needs. No. If we're looking at meeting human needs through the metrics of calories and dollars in the bank account, I guess you could say we're doing a good job, but, um, and actually not even dollars in the bank account. We all have so much debt now, but, um, permaculture fundamentally says, let's just, let's focus on ourselves individually. And, and then once we're good individually, then let's, grow that out to our communities. And so if you've got a whole bunch of communities that are meeting their needs in a, in a way that's good for the ecosystem and, a, and good for them, then we're good. Um, and that's it. And, and permaculture covers the design of waste, <clears throat> wastewater or waste of resource, water harvesting, low energy buildings, <clears throat> food production, the construction of community, um, all facets of human existence can be designed through this lens of permaculture. So fundamentally at its core level, it's a design system. It's like engineering. It's like a holistic version of engineering and architecture and farming all together into one system. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so can you give us a, 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 just a, paint us a picture of what your, 
uh, your permaculture oasis looks like in in Calgary? Like, what kind of foods you grow in there? What kind of uh, what kind of holistic connections do you guys have on your your property when it comes to meeting all your you know food, water, energy, um, community needs, and stuff like that? So I, I'll just start by putting a caveat in there and saying that we could be doing a lot more than we are, um, and and part of my big insight over the last decade has been that um, a lot of the um, things that you can do to meet human needs are actually illegal. <laughs> um, so wow. the, the challenges that we face globally are, are more of a bylaw um, code. Um, like these, there's all these kind of legal barriers that exist at multiple levels of government. Architectural um, guidelines. Yeah, insurance guidelines, mortgage guidelines. Um, and so there's, there's a lot more we could do, but um, because I'm a bit of a loud mouth, um, I have to be very cautious about what I take on. And some people will say, well, just shut up and do it. Like do it, do the illegal stuff and don't say anything about it. But that doesn't mean my holistic context. I'm, I'm an educator, I'm a demonstrator. And so I'd rather know about the things and be able to talk about them and sometimes do them and get caught than, um, than the other way around. Um, for me, just going and doing it doesn't really fulfill what I'm, my purpose. But um, so we, we transformed our backyard into a garden. It's super tiny. Like it's amazing how much we produce in a really, really small space. I think it's, I never actually measured it. I think it's probably about 400 square feet, maybe, maybe, maybe 600 square feet of our square foot passive solar greenhouse. Um, we've got an outdoor kitchen with a cob oven. Um, we harvest, I would say 90% of the rainwater on our property. Um, there's probably about 10% we don't, we don't collect. We did have a gray water harvesting system, which hydrated our garden. Um, but um, because I'm a loud mouth, we got caught. We got a court order and called the cease and desist. So all the bones are there still, but um, it's not connected anymore. Um, our front yard is a food forest. And so we, uh, we grow all of our fruits up there. So things in the food forest that, that are pretty prolific include raspberries, cherries, saskatoons, honeyberries, goji berries, um, strawberries, apples, currants, all types of currants, um, rhodiola, um, sorrel, good King Henry. I mean, it just mint, it just goes on and on and on. So a lot of our um, herbal medicinals come from there. A lot of our fruit comes from there. Um, we have a few roots in there. Um, and it's just generally a really nice space. And it also is just completely different than um, all of our neighbor's yards, So it makes our house kind of stand out um, in the backyard. You know, we grow all of our, it's mostly a kitchen garden because it's so small, but so we grow tomatoes, garlic, uh, kale, chard, broccoli, cabbage, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes, um, various types of squash, onions. It just, it goes on and on and on. Um, and so our goal is a, a, a couple of fold with this garden, knowing that we can't meet all of our needs with it. Um, we kind of approach it from a slightly different perspective. So number one is knowledge um, and knowledge transfer. So demonstrating that you can do a lot in really little space is the knowledge transfer piece. Knowledge is our own personal goal. So learning how to be effective with space, how to be effective with time, um, how to stack plants um, so that when our garden does expand to the one acre or half an acre that we're going to eventually have, um, it's, it's going to be a smooth transition from 400 square feet because we're so good. We'll probably go from 400 to 800 in the first year and then 1600 the year after. And then um, every step change will be much easier than if we just went straight to 25,000 square feet, which is half an acre or 20,000, whatever it is. Um, but I think the most important thing that we get out of this garden is microbes. Um, and so every time I eat a leaf that has not been triple washed, which is what most organic food um, um, goes through when it comes to a grocery store, um, it's probiotics. And um, that's the thing that's just starting to come to the fore right now. There's a few books written on this because we're still, we're in the midst of what's called the microbiome project, where they're actually studying all the microbes that exist in our gut. And um, 
And so we don't know what those microbes are, but we know that consuming them on raw plants in the form of salad, as an example, um, has a dramatic impact on health. So you don't need to grow all your own food, um, but you should grow a little bit of it because part of being bioregionally adapted to your ecosystem, we are of the soil and the soil is of us. Mm -hmm. So the biggest connection that we get of our garden is actually the consumption of um, raw vegetables in the form of salad on a daily basis through the summertime. And then we contribute back to that soil by sending all of our compost back through the garden. And so we are cycling those nutrients. We could add a lot more connections. We could use humanure toilets and we could actually compost our own waste and put that back into the system. We could do gray water, as I mentioned. We could, um, um, you know, so we could, we could add more livestock, you know, like I think every house could have six chickens and meet a half to two thirds of the eggs that they would consume in, in a year. Mm -hmm. um, so now all of their compost is actually getting upgraded. Um, there are so many potential connections. Um, so that's on the food side. We also have solar thermal. So all of our hot water comes from the sun. Um, we re-insulated our entire house. So we use a 10th of the energy that it used 10 years ago. So on, on an annual basis, we use a 10th of the energy that we used to consume. Um, and then within the house, we have two businesses running. <clears throat> um, so every square foot of the house is being consumed or properly put to productive use. Um, and then we have multiple generations living in the house as well. So we co-house with my mother-in-law, which is fantastic for her and it's fantastic for us. Wow. I mean, <clears throat> so that, that's, you, you painted a picture of, of like what your little slice of paradise looks like in, in Calgary, Alberta. What would it look like now if we scaled that up and, you know, permaculture became the norm within our farms and our gardens globally like what would and, and we, we also talked a bit about like the some of the the challenges that are happening in the world right now with you know whether you look at peak energy uh peak phosphorus um peak oil we're we're in the midst of the sixth biggest global extinction event um uh that's ever existed and this one is entirely anthropocentric caused um you know the issues with our water quality the the skyrocketing you know, health issues, all this, all these problems that we look at um, now, what could our world look like if permaculture farms and gardens were the norm? So I think that if we just kind of hit all those main topics, so I think, I mean, water security is a big issue, um, not because there's a shortage of water, but because all of our water uses are single, single use. Yeah. The city of Calgary, if you look at it on the, the total area of the city of Calgary, harvests enough water to meet all of the water needs in Calgary by a factor of two. <laughs> so um, that doesn't mean every single property captures that, but if we look at the aggregate of the city, um, and so most of our present day design in cities is designed on the concentration and disposal of um, rain and storm water. So if we actually took a holistic view of water, we could leave the Bow River alone um, and allow it to continue to be a, a productive fish bearing stream. And we could meet most of our water needs as a result of um, water harvesting. And that would force us to reduce our daily water consumption. So the other thing is that people use about 300 liters per capita per day. The reason the numbers are so high is because there's no feedback. So if you started living off of a rain tank um, in Brisbane, when they, when they had the massive drought in 2007, they reduced their daily water consumption from 300 liters down to about 167 liters per day. Massive reduction, like 40%. Just because they were living on tanks and they had a bunch of water restrictions, everybody kind of got together and, and reduced. And they're still keeping up with that reduction today because they have feedback now. So what's really interesting about water is that um, 30 percent of the energy that a city um, consumes like the city of Calgary as an organization goes to pumping water and treating sewage so in reducing our water consumption and self-supplying we would eliminate the use of coal and natural gas to pump the water to our houses now power actually has an embodied water in it as well because it takes water to produce power so there's there's embodied energy in water and there's embodied water and energy so by getting our water piece right, we could instantly reduce our footprint by 
30% potentially. Um, and um, our river rivers would improve and all of the ecologies around us would improve as well. Our own health would improve. Um, chlorinated water contributes to the death of the microbiome. So there's been studies done where they've compared kids that drank rainwater versus mains water with chlorine in it. And the kids that drank rainwater got sick less often than the kids that drank chlorinated water. So our health would improve. Um, energy, I mean, part of the reason, I mean, the energy is a really big topic. You talk about that for an hour, but if we focus it on turning our houses into these little oases, every calorie of food we consume from the conventional food system takes 10 calories of, of hydrocarbon. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Iowa um, consumes something like 10,000 Hiroshima bombs worth of energy every year just to, to plant corn and soy. Um, so agriculture is very energy intensive. And so I'd say farms would move more to producing things that can walk off the farm versus trying to produce annual crops that cause massive amounts of soil erosion and consume enormous amounts of energy and chemicals. Um, and the reason that they would transfer that is because cities could easily be self-sufficient um, with, you know, their own vegetables. Cities could produce all of their own vegetative needs, um, whether it's greens and potatoes and corn and all that stuff could happen in cities which would relegate farms back to grasslands and, um, and producing animals um, as opposed to um, feed essentially for animals and, and humans, um, which would in doing that, if cities made, produced all of their own um, vegetables and we relegated all the farmland back to grassland, mostly so either silviculture or just perennial prairie, um, there's a stat that I read that if, if all of the land in Iowa, south to the Gulf of Mexico, east to the Mississippi was turned back into grassland and transferred out of corn, soy, cotton, all that stuff, the US would be carbon neutral overnight without changing any of their activities. So in doing so, we'd all improve our own internal health because we'd be eating nutrient dense foods that weren't triple washed because they were grown with human sewage that, that has all sorts of stuff in it. Um, and we'd become carbon neutral at the same time. And in doing that, because the carbon levels in the soil would go up, the erosion, the Mississippi would probably turn clear again. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I mean, we could go on and on and on and on, but basically the, the, the problems that we face as a species is because we silo everything. So this person's responsible for food and that's all they do. And it's completely disconnected from this person who's responsible for housing and this person who's responsible for city planning and this person over here who's responsible uh, you know as a doctor all of these things touch each other and we treat them like they're all separate entities that don't you know have any kind of connection between themselves um, and ultimately you know our own health our own quality of life um, is our own responsibility which kind of is a nice way to round this out. Um, the prime directive of permaculture is to take responsibility for our actions from that of our children um, and to transform our homes and gardens so that they shelter and feed us. Mm -hmm. The exact opposite exists right now. We don't take responsibility for our actions and that of our children. And our ho homes are basically just giant consumers. They consume fertilizer, they consume energy, they consume water, they produce waste. If the, the best analogy of the North American home right now is a super sick hospital patient. You know, they've got a bedpan because they can't take care of their waste. They've got IV drip lines coming into their arms to bring them water and food. Um, and they can't walk. They're, they're running around in wheelchairs and motorized vehicles because they're, they're so atrophied. They've got no musculature left in their body. Um, we have got to take our responsibility for our own actions. And when we start doing that in a way that's beneficial to us, everything else around us will start to improve. Absolutely. You know, when you're, when you're saying, talking there that I was reminded of one of my favorite quotes from, from Jeff Lawton, who was, who was both of our, um, our teachers, um, is that, you know, all of the world's problems can be solved in a garden. And I mean, it's just so true when, when, we, when we take responsibility for our own actions and we put ourselves back into the feedback loops, all these problems disappear. Peak energy, peak oil, the biodiversity loss, uh, the, the human health problems from nutrient density, all of those things fall away uh, 
just out of out of necessity and yeah so i mean from from there it's like what 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 can people do so like we're we're on the we're on the precipice you know society is standing on the edge of a knife um and any one of these things that we just mentioned could could knock us off and break the camel's back um what can we do as individuals now to start to to change our projection from going into a downward spiral every year things get worse and we we're losing more species and all this stuff to we're creating more possibilities and and as you said permaculture is um is a way uh, it's it's not about how do we you know protect the environment um uh it is it's like well, i really like your quote there i'm just gonna try to find it here um it's it's it, it's moving from how do we meet our needs versus how do we meet our needs while enhancing the biosphere like what's what's step one in with that in that directive well, I can tell you what step one was for me, um, you know, before I got into all of this stuff, I was an oil and gas engineer. Um, so after the cake factory, I was an oil and gas engineer. <laughs> um, and uh, I, my life changing event that, that, that completely changed the way that I looked at the world was I took a permaculture design course. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd still be teaching it if I didn't think that that was a, um, a pretty about valuable step there's lots of ways to get there but um I, I think the other thing that people need to keep in mind especially in in 2018 and going forward is that we live in a totally new type of problem space now mm -hmm. um the problem space of a decade ago was um um the scarcity basically there wasn't enough you know you really had to work hard to get information now we live in an abundance problem space, which means there's too much. So now you don't, you don't have to worry about how many photos you take on your camera because you're not actually getting them printed um, and you don't have to put film into it anymore. Now it's like, where are those photos gonna go? Which ones am I gonna delete? If I am going to, um, if I am going to print them, which ones am I gonna print? Um, it's the same thing exists for information. So I think the, the uh everybody's going to have a different um kind of entry point if you will but um i think what's really important is that and you kind of hit on it is that there are a lot of nasty wicked problems out there um they're scary as heck and they can completely shut you down um they don't need to be scary but um you know put your own airplane mask on first and and the reason that that's really important is that um, if none of these scary things happen, you're going to live longer, you're going to have a better quality of life, um, you're going to enjoy your life more as a result of it. Um, and so it's, it's kind of asymmetric. And if something does happen, like we run out of phosphorus or peak oil becomes a thing in the next 50 years, um, or we run out of water, um, or any of these things, um, you're going to have the right skills to be able to manage those, those complex issues. Um, and so it's a win-win scenario. So I guess, um, ask yourself when you're consuming information, whether it's, you know, sitcoms or, um, I don't know, uh, America's got talent or whatever TV shows or things that you consume, is this signal or noise? Um, is it actually propelling me towards a better life? Um, and uh, if you just focus on improving your own health, what's really interesting about um, health, health can be a, a primary guide towards um, making the world a better place. You've got a great statement on your, um, on your website. What, what is it? Eat the change? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's the, if, if we take that, that, that same, you know, the, the quote, all the world's problems can be solved in a garden you take it one step further is that if we all just started eating the change that we want to see in the world three times a day, all these problems disappear. I think all the world's problems can be solved with Dakota's pork. <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty good too. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's, um, it's pretty simple. And I think the, the garden thing is, is when I first heard it, I thought it was pretty glib and like, that's ridiculous, but mm -hmm. 
Um, the reason I really like the analogy of gardening is um, gardening holds so many different reasons. I mean, it's, it's really the discussion of our own environment. Um, it's our, like the, the ecosystem that we create around ourselves is our garden. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but two or three bucks a pack, like gardens are really inexpensive to, yeah. to produce. Um, and so, and, and, and in fact, they actually can probably have, they will probably have a bigger effect on the environment than solar panels or wind turbines. Um, you know, when you look at the embodied water and energy Absolutely. in, it's crazy. Absolutely. And, and there's all, there's all these benefits of getting, getting, you know, putting ourselves back into, into the, the, the feedback loop. And, and a lot of them are, um, uh, for myself and, and, um, one of the next interviews I'm hoping to do is uh, with another friend of mine from Calgary, uh, Liz Dorholt, and her experience of, of teaching at-risk youth to garden and the incredible, or, or actually Vaden, I should interview Vaden Summers and, and the, the effects that he's seen on at-risk youth when he teaches them how to look after a tomato plant. Like, it, something changes in you when you stop b- from being a tourist on this planet to being somebody who's actively engaged with the biosphere and is a part of the ecosystem. And yeah, um, yeah which I think is, is a much larger conversation, but um, all, the, all these things start to shift. And, and food totally. is, a great, is a great segue and, um, and all of us do it. Like, you know, there's, <laughs> no matter how you look at it, everybody's gonna eat, unless you're raw, maybe, you know, eat every, every once every three days, but, but, uh, yeah, we, so, I mean, like, just to summarize this, Rob, is like, what, um, do you have any, um, do you have any favorite quotes or kind of words of hope or, or any, any stories you'd like to share about uh, just kind of what's, what's possible and, and moving forward? I mean, the problems are so simple uh, at the end of the day. It's, it's all up here. And so, um I think the the best thing that we can do as individuals is we have to make the change taste better. It's got to be more fun. It's got to be guilt free, um, and we just all have to do it one at a time. And um, food is a wonderful way to um, get people to think about the world differently, and it um, it's it, it it gets beyond religion and political beliefs i mean even what's funny is that the white house in the united states eats all organic food (laughs) right so it doesn't matter what your your belief or position is in life food is universal to the human experience so we can all participate in this regardless of Mm -hmm. what we believe absolutely Okay, well, I mean, I just want to say thanks so much again for your time today and for all the work that, that you and Michelle do through Birch Permaculture. Uh, if folks are interested, they can, uh, I'll put it in the show, show notes below, but head over to Rob's YouTube channel right now and dive into, um, I don't know, how many years worth of content do you have? Speaking of, of signal and noise, <laughs> Rob has a, a video just about, on just about any topic you can think of when it comes to um uh you know moving from the you know where we are now as a site to where we need to be whether it's whether it's water security food security um energy systems all this stuff he's i I can't there's there's hundreds of videos on there and then um i'll put a link to that but i'll also throw a link up to rob michelle's website there's tons of free resources on there rob writes uh about two or three blogs a week um, that are uh, very high quality. Uh, he's on Medium. Uh, are there any other places that folks can go to get more Rob in their life? <laughs> <laughs> I think that that would be probably more than most people can handle. So, <laughs> YouTube and Medium. Those are my two uh, uh, areas of choice, and I've got a, a quite a few blogs on our website as well. Cool. And, and if folks are interested, I, I highly recommend, I've, I've taken myself uh, four PDCs now. Um, Rob Michelle's PDC is by far the, <clears throat> the best PDC I've ever taken. 
Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. It will change your life. It'll give you community and a sense of hope for, for what we can do as a species. And yeah, thanks so much for taking the time and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks Dakota. You're doing great stuff too. I look forward to our next conversation. See ya. Talk soon.